that's false. So you're wrong, Zachary, you're wrong, Max. Okay. See, here's another interesting question. But here's a question. Yeah, all right. I'll have to look this one up. Did anybody read the book? Well, we'll get that one for now. All right. Lesson 28. Holy Communion. What is Holy Communion? Teresa. What is Holy Communion? Yes, that's pretty much what Teresa said. Oh. It says Holy Communion is the receiving of Jesus Christ in the sacrament of the Holy Eucharist. So Holy Communion is when you receive him. Okay. So it's not just him being there. That would be a good explanation of the real presence. Our Lord is really present. What does it mean to be present, Julia? Do you know? It means you're there. Very good. So what does it mean if you're really present? It means you're there. You're really there, doesn't it? Yes. So we mean, when we say the real presence, we mean Jesus is really there. Where is Jesus really? He's in heaven and he's everywhere. Yes. That's, that's all right. Uh, but we call the real presence where he is with his body and blood. Where's that? In his body? Yeah, in his body. No. That's in heaven, right? Yeah. Yes. But it's also in the Blessed Sacrament, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And you receive in Holy Communion. Yes. So when we say the real presence, we mean our Lord is really and truly present with his body, blood, soul, and divinity in the Holy Eucharist under the appearances of bread and wine. Mm -hmm. So is our Lord really present in the tabernacle? Yes. Yes, he is. That's why we genuflect and we kneel before the tabernacle. Yes, very good. Okay. So, so we receive Holy Communion under the form of bread, under the appearances of bread only. Okay. We don't receive it under the appearance of wine as well. Mm -hmm. What is necessary to receive Holy Communion worthily? Uh, Angela. A true repentance for our sins. A true repentance for our sins. No. Yes. Yeah. We have to be the state of grace. Yes. But it's a. I'll tell you what. The answer is six lines long. Jack, can you, can you expand on that? I never. Not really. Well, that's really, it. Uh, maybe not six lines. It is necessary to be. You, we can never know for sure if we're in a state of grace or not. But you have to be free from mortal sin. In other words, you're not conscious of a mortal sin. Even St. Thomas Aquinas, who appeared to him, somebody appeared to him, the first question he asked was, Am I in a state of grace? And he probably never committed a mortal sin in his life. He was very good from when he was a little boy. That's the first question he asked. Uh, was it an angel or was it a saint? I can't remember. I think it was a saint. And the uh, first thing he said was, Oh, am I in the state of grace? I don't know what the state of his soul was. Hmm. Yeah, go to confession or not. To receive holy word, word, communion wordly is necessary to be free from mortal sin. That means we're not conscious, we're not aware of any mortal sins that we haven't confessed. Hmm. Free from mortal sin. To have a right intention, a right intention, to intend to receive our Lord, to honor Him, and to avoid, obey, obey the church's law on the fast required before Holy Communion, out of reverence for the body and blood of our divine Lord. Okay. However, there are in some cases in which Holy Communion may be received without fasting. So if you're dying, you just eat, you'll see without fasting. Otherwise, it's not mutual. 
Yes. Is it, is it fasting three hours before mass or three hours before communion? Yeah, it says we observe the, observe the uh, no, it's three hours before communion for the laity. For the priest, it's three hours before mass. Yeah, fast required, it just says the fast required because the fast might change, see? The fast is a disciplinary law, it's not uh, a law of faith, so it can be. In the early days, they didn't have a fast because our Lord gave the the Holy Communion. He said the first Mass after the Last Supper, so the Apostles weren't fasting at all. So, so they didn't institute a fast uh, right in that way. The Church instituted the fast later out of reverence for the Body and Blood of our Lord. So it, it wasn't in the beginning. They had the Agape, which was a, a feast. And St. Paul complained, you know, he said, because uh, uh, he said this was for the poor people. He said, don't you have houses to eat and drink in? Some of you get drunk and everything at the Agape, the feast before the before the Mass. So they started by having that in the early days of the church because the Last Supper was a feast. Hmm? All right? But that law was changed. Hmm? So venial sin does not make us unworthy of receiving Holy Communion, but it does prevent us from receiving the more abundant graces and blessings which we otherwise receive from Holy Communion. So we should be sorry for all of our venial sins as well before we go to Holy Communion. Venial sin, what does venial mean? We've had this before. Venial. Venial sin, Max. Things are not so serious, are they? Uh... Not exactly, no. So, who remembers what venial means? <laughs> you have to repeat and repeat. That's why you never finish with the catechism. You've got to repeat and repeat. Venial means easily, easily pardoned. Easily pardoned. You don't have to go to confession to get a venial sin pardoned, do you? So why is it easily pardoned? Why? Because it's small. No, not because it's small. It's All sins offensive. are big. Because they're offenses against God. A lot of those parts are offensive. Because it's not mortal? Yes. Can you explain that now? Uh, well, it doesn't uh, make you damned forever. Well, mortal sins only make you damned forever if you die with it. Huh? Max. Well, it doesn't kill your soul like does, it does kill your soul. That's right. So, explain now. Yeah, or We've explained this before. So it's not as serious as a mortal sin, is it? Uh, yeah, but that's not what Vino means. I said it means easily pardoned. But why is it easily pardoned? Zachary. Because you can easily get rid of it by making the sign of the cross or have a sprinkling of holy water. Yes, I'm sorry, yes. Why can you do that? Max said it already. But he didn't explain it. Because it's not a mortal sin. It doesn't kill the soul. See, the soul is like the body. We'll talk explain it again. Uh, a living body... Okay, say you come up to a dead guy and you stick a knife in him. Alright? Now, is, is that wound going to heal? Okay, now say you come up to a living guy and you stick a knife in him. All right? Now, you could maybe go to the doctor and get something done. You could sew it up or something. Or you could maybe just do nothing. But either way, what's going to happen? Yeah. It's going to heal. It will eventually heal, right? Because the living body heals itself. Well, the same, the living soul can heal itself. So your soul's still alive with a venial sin, so it's alive, and because it's alive, it can heal itself by an act of contrition or by taking holy water and being sorry for the sins. And that's, that's why it can heal itself, and so uh, that's why, uh, that's why uh, a, 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 a venial sin is easily pardoned, because you can heal yourself. With a mortal sin, you're dead, you have to go and get confession and get resurrected. So you have to get a great grace from God to repent of a mortal sin. If you commit a mortal sin, it takes a great grace to repent of that. Say, I don't want that sin anymore. And then you can go to confession and get resurrected from the dead. So that's why it was easily pardoned. And that's why, see, before communion, the altar boys say the confidior, and the priest gives an absolution. 
before, we do it at the beginning of Mass, and then we do it again before Communion, and that absolution will take away your venial sins if you're sorry for them. So that's why it's important for the altar boy to get the confidio right. And, uh, not make any mistakes and uh, get it right, because he's speaking for everybody. So we have to do that, and then, uh, then we get that before we have Holy Communion. Okay. All right, so to receive it wordly, we can't be aware of any mortal sins, and we have to be fasting. Okay. If we're not fasting, we're not worthy to receive Holy Communion. Okay. Does he who knowingly receives Holy Communion in mortal sin receive the body and blood of Christ and his graces? That's two questions. Really, if you go have a mortal sin, you go to communion, do you receive the body and blood of Christ? Yes, I go to confession. I you, go to confession. Yeah, but you don't go to confession. You just go up and say, oh, I'm going to go to communion. Because <laughs> my mother's watching and I'll get in trouble if I don't go to communion and all that. And so I better just go. Zachary. And you don't get the... Angela. You do get the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, but you don't get the graces. Right, you still receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. But you put him in a filthy soul where there's no place for him, so you don't get any grace. You know? so that's a, a grave sin of sacrilege to knowingly receive Holy Communion <coughs> in the state of mortal sin. What you happens if creation you get you commit a sin? Pardon me? What happens if you don't know you have a mortal Sin, well, if you don't know, that's what we said. You have to be not aware of a mortal sin. I told you nobody can know for sure if he's in the state of grace. So you have, if you're aware of a mortal sin, right? that's so why, does it get locked away? That's why we sin? didn't say somebody said you had to be in the state of grace. You well, know, to receive a word, but you just have to be not aware of any mortal sins. So does it get locked away? Well, if you have contrition for it, the Holy Communion could take it away. Yes, you should have to still. When you remember it, you have to go to confession. What should we do to receive more abundantly the graces of Holy Communion? What should we do to receive more abundantly, get greater graces? So you see uh, Jet going up to Holy Communion, so oh, I want to get more graces than him. What do I have to do? Right. Right. Yeah. Yes, it said we should receive uh, more abundantly the grace of Holy Communion. We should try to be more fervent, to, to love our Lord more and say, Lord, I want you to come into my soul and free ourselves from venial sin, from deliberate venial sin. Yes. All right, so this is a, a, a historical question. So you used to have to fast from midnight. At midnight, so if you're having an evening dinner party or something like that, but you've got to stop at midnight if you want to go to communion in the morning. So you used to have to fast from midnight. Pope Pius XII changed that. So he changed the, the fast to, the, to uh, the three hours. A lenient fast. When may Holy Communion be received without fasting? Two reasons here. Two times. One is it's more difficult. Uh, uh, Max. I know. One. When you're about to die from it? Yes. That's right. Very good. Holy Communion be received without fasting. One is in danger of death. So you can receive the attica in danger of death even if you just ate something or you're in the hospital and they, they gave you something. They just brought in tea and then the priest shows up. When you're in danger of death, you can receive Holy Communion without fasting. Now, what's another reason? It's a hard one. Not very many. It would be very rare, too. Zachary? If you want to really need to, like, say you were going to go to war and you wanted to go to Mass, but you ate, and then... No. There's no. That's no excuse. You should have fasted. You're making an excuse for not fasting. No, there's no excuse for not fasting. That's not the reason. The other reason, this is a hard one, I said, you will get it. When it's necessary to save the Blessed Sacrament from insult or injury. Insult or injury. There was some uh, saint, some 
He broke into the tabernacle and they scattered the hosts on the floor or something like this. And St. Mike took them all under the thumb. So, pray to say the blessed sacrament of insult or injury you can receive without fasting. So, does that mean you could also eat it multiple times if you're going to be alone? Well, you could have multiple hosts, I guess. Yeah. I think actually they did one, one a day, actually. That was good. Uh, you, in that situation, Father, where they, you said it was scattered on the floor, you can't pick them up still, can you? Well, they pick them up with your tongue, yeah. Can you pick it up with a coffee? No. What about the glass that we use for the chalice? Yeah, chalice, but you don't use that for the host, do you? Oh. Well, you can't, no. Well, you can't do that, no. All right. Okay, the danger of death or to save the blessed sacrament from insult or injury. All right, here's a, a question. Maybe you know it. I think you do. What are the laws enacted by Pope Pius XII regarding the fast required before Holy Communion? Well, that's not number one, though. That's number three. <coughs> No, this is regarding the question is what are the laws enacted by Pius XII regarding the fast required oh, before okay. Holy Communion? Does anybody know any of them? You can't drink one hour before communion. Can't drink what? Um anything except for water. Anything except for water, yes. So that was a lenient thing. Water didn't break the fast anymore after Pius XII. Mm -hmm. So when you had a fast from midnight, you couldn't have water either. So when people, sometimes they were walking long ways uh, to like uh, Fatima, and they had a fast until they got there. They didn't take water either. Water can be taken any time before Holy Communion without breaking the fast. So water does not break the fast. Sick persons may receive Holy Communion after taking medicine or non-alcoholic drinks. So cough medicine, I think, is an alcoholic drink, isn't it? I think it usually has alcohol in cough medicine, doesn't it? Yeah. It depends. So you can take that medicine anyway. All Catholics may receive Holy Communion after fasting three hours from food and alcoholic drinks and one hour from non-alcoholic drinks. So Coke, one hour. Coffee, one hour. This applies to Holy Communion at midnight mass as well as at mass is celebrated in the morning, afternoon, or evening. Okay. So three hour fast from food and alcohol and one hour from non-alcoholic drinks. Catholics are observed or urged, this is what he, when he made the law, he says you should try to keep the midnight fast. Masses formerly, and also to compensate for the use of the new privilege by works of charity and penances. They're not obligatory. Right. Would that have been the same if it was an afternoon mass? Pardon me? If it would have been the same in an afternoon mass? Like masses at 5 o'clock would be still like this afternoon mass? But yes, but uh, you weren't allowed to say mass after uh, afternoon, after one in the morning. One, they stretch it to one. I think you could start mass after 1 p.m. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you still had a fact. So priests could say a morning mass in one city, evening mass in another city. It was impossible. Then. It started out, there were no afternoon evening masses until the whole fight. That's why it says even when the mass is at midnight, you have to fast three hours. Because when you, that was added, that was added on later. Because in the United States, at least in, in all the uh, major cities, uh, they had a midnight mass every Sunday. So uh, people that got off work. They could go to mass before they went home at 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock. We used to go to that sometimes when we were going on a trip. It was like mass. And at first, when he changed the law, uh, so at, at, at first, then, see, people didn't have to fast when they only had a fast from midnight. So you could go to the pub, you get off work at 10 o'clock, you go to the pub and have a couple of beers, and then go to mass, and you, you make, making the fast. 
for, for the Holy Communion. So it's three hours also for midnight mass. So they added that later. And I saw people abusing that a little bit. Okay. How should we prepare ourselves for uh, Holy Communion? Angela. Say it in your conscience. Yes. And after you do that? Holy Confession. Yes. What if you're already in chapel getting ready for Holy Communion? Mass is going on. Uh, do you can't leave, don't want to miss Mass, so you can't go up and go to confession. Pardon? An act of contrition. Oh, act of contrition. Anything else, Zachary? That's it? Anything else? Julia? Um, by saying the communion prayers? Yes. Which ones in particular? Um. The ones before you receive? Prayers before Holy Communion in your missal? Yeah. Uh, Leah? Um, say the Acts of Faith. Yeah, the Acts of Faith. The Acts of Faith, Hope, and Charity, especially, as well as Contrition. Yes, Faith, Hope, and Charity, and Contrition. We should prayer recommend uh, Holy Communion by thinking of the Divine Redeemer who we are about to receive. So know what you're doing. So I'm going to receive our Lord. Don't just walk up and not pay attention to what you're doing. So you have to do what you're doing. Do it with your mind and your heart as well as with your, your body. So if you're, you're a daydreamer or thinking about uh, you're hungry and you're thinking about lunch and you're just worried about your lunch and you walk up to communion and stick your, stick your tongue out and receive Holy Communion, well, see, that's not a very fervent communion. So you've got to do what you're doing so realize I'm receiving our Lord. And uh, make, then it says make act, fervent acts of faith, hope, love, and contrition. Faithful, charity, and contrition. We should also be neat, clean, and modest in our appearance. Neat, clean, and modest. So the dress code that went by the wayside. We should have a jacket and tie on, especially on Sundays, Benny. Benny, did you hear me? I said you should have a jacket and tie on, especially on Sundays. Yeah. Your appearance. Okay. Now, when actually receiving Holy Communion, this is very important, pay attention. You should raise the head so you don't look down like this. Okay. Raise the head and put the tongue out. Okay. I think you all know that. Some people don't know that. Raise the head and extend the tongue. And then we should swallow the sacred host as soon as possible, not allowing it to dissolve in the mouth. You swallow it. You're not supposed to chew it either. It doesn't say that here, but you're not supposed to chew it. You just swallow it. Zachary? Uh, should you receive it with your eyes open or your eyes closed or it doesn't matter? Uh, you should lower your eyes. Yes, you don't have to necessarily close them, but you don't stare at the priest, right? You do receive the Holy Communion. Especially if you're a beautiful girl. And if you can't... Uh, Since leave. you're not a beautiful girl, it's less sin for you. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> what? You can't what? If you can't... Swallow the host whole. Is it fine if you like break it in half or something? Yes, if you can do that. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes it sticks to the roof of your mouth or something like that. Then you got to get it out with your tongue. <laughs> or that's it. Sometimes you do that. See? You want to swallow it as soon as possible. So you eat something, you have to swallow it. Swallow is part of eating. If you don't eat, swallow it. You haven't eaten it, have you? What should we do after Holy Communion? <coughs> Celine. Um, um, like acts of thanksgiving until, you know, well, until 15 minutes after. No. After Holy Communion, Andrew, were you going to say something more than that? Uh, just the same thing. We should spend some time adoring our Lord, thanking Him. Renewing our promises of love and of obedience to Him. Say, I'm going to try better to obey your law, Lord. Yes. And asking Him for blessings for ourselves and others. So ask Him for what you need. So yes, we should spend some time in communion or talking with our Lord. Communion means what? Who can translate communion? Benny. To talk. No, it doesn't mean to talk. You leave. Do you know? Um, I don't think you do. Mm -hmm. What does calm mean? C O M. Um, it 
means calm down. Calm down? No, it doesn't mean calm down. Anxious? No, what does union mean? One. One. Yes. One together. Yes. So communion is, uh, is the prefix uh, calm, which means with. So union with, you're night, you become one with our Lord. Does our Lord become one with you? Mm -hmm. No, he doesn't want to be like you. You become one with him, all right? So you become one with him. So you become more like him with the Holy Communion. So you should spend some time with him. Get some time. And they say, yes, 15 minutes is what, what time it usually takes for your body, since you're fasting, to digest the host. That's uh, the scientific uh, uh, a theory that you can't. I don't know if they can prove that or not, but anyway. Mm -hmm. no. What are the chief effects of a worthy communion? Zachary? Sanctifying grace. Yes, what about sanctifying grace? We get more sanctifying grace. An increase in sanctifying grace, yes. That's number two. That's number one. There's four here. Your higher place in heaven? Well, you don't get your place in heaven until the judgment. You gotta die before you get a place in heaven. So if you're on your deathbed, you might say that. Alright, I'll tell you. A closer you first, the closer you with our Lord, and the more fervent love of God and of our neighbor. This is a worthy holy communion. And so the more fervent you are when you receive it, the more you desire to receive our Lord. You say, I want to make an effort to get the Mass so I can receive our Lord. The more you have great desire, then the more graces you get. But it's a closer union, closer union with our Lord, and a more fervent love of God and of our neighbor. So it increases your charity. And then second, an increase of sanctifying grace, which makes you again more like God, more holy. Third, preservation from mortal sin. So it's the nourishment for your soul that gives you the grace not to commit mortal sin, to run away from occasions of sin and to not commit mortal sin. And the remission of venial sin. The remission of venial sin. So Holy Communion can remit venial sins as well if you're always have to have contrition for that. Fourth, the lessening of our inclinations to sin and the help to practice good works. So it strengthens you, so you're less inclined to commit those sins, and you get help to practice the good works. What are the good works? Well, that's an easy question. Jet. No, those aren't works, those are acts. No, those aren't works, those are commandments. Angela. The spiritual and corporal works of mercy. The spiritual and corporal works of mercy. The Ten Commandments is a rule that you have to follow. It's not a work you do. If you say, well, I keep the commandments, I do a work. With some commandments, you just have to not do something. Thou shalt not. That's not a, that's not a work. It's just not doing something. Okay. So no, it's uh, the, uh, spiritual, the spiritual and corporal works of mercy are the chief uh, works. And so it helps us to practice good works. When are we obliged to receive Holy Communion? Worthily, of course. Jet? On, on Sunday or on Easter at least. No. Every and day. Holy every day if you can. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Easter. We're not obliged to receive Holy Communion every day. Obliged means you have to do it. So you have to receive make your Easter Communion under pain of mortal sin. So at least once a year you have to make a worthy Holy Communion. So that's your Easter Communion. And then what does it say? And when you're in a danger of death. When you're in a danger of death, you have to receive Holy Communion. So those are two times you have to make a worthy Holy Communion. Now here's a question that you're trying to answer before. Why is it well to receive Holy Communion often, even daily? Angela? Extra, extra graces? Yes, we get extra graces. Uh, Max? It's like food for your soul. Yes. Become more like God? Yes. 
It says, uh, it's well to receive Holy Communion often, even daily. It's this intimate union with, see, that's what the nuns and the monks do in the monastery. They go to Mass every morning, usually. Most of them do, anyway. Maybe sometimes some of them don't. Even daily, because the intimate union with Jesus Christ, the source of all holiness and the giver of all graces, is the greatest aid to a holy life. So going to communion frequently or daily is the greatest aid to a holy life, to becoming holy. How should we show our gratitude? What does gratitude mean? Leah? Be grateful for something. You're grateful. Use the word to define itself. <laughs> but what does gratitude mean? Use a different version of the word. Thankful for something. Pardon me? Thankful for something. Thankful for something. Yes. How should we show our gratitude to our Lord to remain always in our altars in the Holy Eucharist? Well, we should show our gratitude to our Lord by for remaining always on our altars in the Holy Eucharist by visiting Him often. So make a visit to the Blessed Sacrament. I think in the Eucharist Crusade we record our visits to the Blessed Sacrament, don't we? Yes, that's what you're supposed to put. How many times you visit the Blessed Sacrament? So you can visit the Blessed Sacrament more than once a day. This is the Blessed Sacrament often. By reverence in church. So be behaving in church genuflecting, having a good posture, and uh, so you don't sit cross-legged in church. You sit cross-legged on the couch, and not in church. So you have a, a reverence in church. By assisting every day at Mass when this is possible, by attending parish devotions, like the Rosary or Benediction or the Ramos Apostolate, parish devotion. And by being present at benediction of the Blessed Sacrament. What is benediction of the Blessed Sacrament? Angela? The exposure and adoration of our Lord. Expo exposure and adoration of our Lord, yes, that's right. It says the cer ceremony in which the Blessed Sacrament, the Sacred House is exposed, that's what you said, for a time on the altar, usually in the monstrance. During benediction, the priest blesses the people with the sacred host. So the benediction is actually when the priest gives the blessing with the sacred host. That's like getting the blessing from our Lord, see? That's what benediction means. But, uh, we, we usually do that when we have uh, the exposure of the blessed sacrament. We usually have benediction as well. So it's in the monstrance. What does monstrance mean? What does the monstrance do? It holds something. Pardon? It holds something. Holds the host, yes. All right, what English word do we have? Exactly. Is, is it the monster uh, like a sort of like a showcase for like yes. stores the, the host so like everybody can see it? That's right. No, that's that's correct. Yes, that's that's the right answer. Yes. <laughs> What English word do we have that's like monstrance? Monastery. What? Monastery. What was that? Who said something? Uh, hmm? Me, Father. What'd you say? Monastery. Monastery. Yeah, closer than that. Monastery, not exactly. No, that's a completely different word. It comes from the word. It comes from the same root as monstrance. Don't know. All right. We'll put a D-E in front. Demonstrate. Demonstrate. Yes. See, that comes from the same root as monstrance. You demonstrate. You show something. So as uh, Max said, the monstrance is for showing something. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's called a monstrance. Well, uh, the word demonstrate came later. That's uh, Latin was there before the English word. Yes, we, get, we took our English word demonstrate. We show something, don't we? So monstrance shows us the Blessed Sacrament. Uh, it's supposed to be shaped like a sun with rays, rays on a pedestal, so the rays of the sun because it's uh, got the sun got in it. Now they have funny monstrances now in the new church. The monstrance is a, 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 is a large vessel in which the host is exposed to view through a glass covered opening in the center. And he uses the cope and the humeral veil. 
Do any of you girls know what a copa and hemophile are? No? Well, the humeral barrel is the barrel that the first wears when he holds the monster's heart. That's correct, yes. It's the blessed sacrament holds it, that's the veil. Why is it called a humeral veil? Anybody know that? Well, the boys all know that. What do your girls know? Who does anatomy? Alright, you got a your bones in your shoulders called humeral. So the humeral veil goes over your shoulders. That's what it's called. That's where it got its name. It goes over the shoulders. And we had the boys were supposed to wear humeral veils when they carried the uh, mitre and the, and the crozier. But the bishop didn't bring a crozier. So he came crozierless. So we didn't have the crozier when he came here. So maybe we should not probably publish a sermon because everybody's going, why, why isn't he going to crozier? What kind of bishop is that? <laughs> we don't have a parish crozier. We're probably not likely to get one. So that's the humor whale and the crozier. So that's the humor whale. It's worn over his shoulder and he wears the cope. The cope is the, the, one, the garment we wear when we process in for high mass. It's a cope. So they come in different colors and we use them for the, the absolution of the body and a funeral. Cope. cope. So the word for cope, actually, in Latin, we, it means for the rain. It means a rain cope, a cloak for the rain. That's how it started originally, but now we, they're nice and we don't want to get them wet, so we don't want to wear them in the rain. But that's actually what the name means, the Puviali, so it means for the rain. So, but, so, so we, don't, we don't want to wear the rain coat when it's raining because uh, it's not good for it to get wet. Yeah. Any questions? All right, we'll go to Rosary now. I think, what time is it? It's 21 after or 27 after? 27. We still have to say a prayer and go to Rosary. All right. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and then glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost.